Hello, everyone. Now we have a new side event, and this is a very special side event. All side events are special. So, so, uh, but what is special with this is that now we try to look ahead, and it's difficult to even see today, and sometimes it's difficult also to see back because then we have all these translations that we must do, and having the historical knowledge. But what we are doing now is to launching a book that was ready around uh, New Year. It, it, the, the, the hardcover was ready in January, but we found out that it was smart to launch it at this conference. Uh, and the book is Scenarios for International Cooperation in the Arctic 2035. Um, and the, the real book title is Global Development in the Arctic, International Cooperation for the Future. Uh, and it's edited by Andrei Mineyev, Anatoly Burmistrov, and me. And just to say, it, I have been so happy to be together with these two great researchers. And we have had some uh, important discussions. But Andrei Mineyev, Associate Professor Researcher, has done most of the work in putting together all the, 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 the pieces from the different uh, contributors. And there have been quite many contributors. Uh, and we think this is a very valuable book. And it goes into some kind of, uh, let's say, a Syria. About 2005, I think, there came a book about scenarios uh, for what will happen in the Barents Sea. And in 2015, we made a book. And some of you were also, of the authors, you were involved in that. And that was about new scenarios for what will happen in the Barents Sea uh, until 2025 or something like that, 10 years ahead. And scenarios are scenarios. And some of that we could see. We could see some of these scenarios in reality. But then we started uh, to two, two and a half years back to say that, OK, now it was time to, to try to see uh, in the future again. And I'm very happy for all the contributions that have been made. And today we do it like this, that we will have uh, some small inside snaps of what are in the chapters. So there are, are some who have been invited. But I'm very happy that Vidar Ulriksen, State Secretary uh, of the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Fisheries, has been so, so, so nice to be with us today and even say some few words. So Vidar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to say a few words at the launch of this compelling book. The Arctic represents both challenges and opportunities. The government believes that global cooperation is crucial to solving the challenges ahead. Over the last 50 years, Norway's aquaculture and fishing industry has been seen a steady growth in no small part due to cooperations with our neighbor. We have developed robust management regimes and with a long-term perspective, we have aimed for sustainability. As I mentioned before today, the Blue Justice Initiative, launched by Norway in 2019, is another example of how global cooperation can be productive. This initiative will assist nations in opposing organized fisheries crime, which we know contributes to poverty, exploitation of workers, and destruction of natural resources. Keeping up our efforts at the IMO to strengthen the transition to green shipping globally is also vital. This development will help build a market for green shipping and strengthen research and development of these technologies. We believe global cooperation is key 
to solving global challenges. Technical cooperation is essential to reach our goals. In addition to enhanced bilateral cooperation, both the IMO and of particular relevance to this event, the Arctic Council have important roles to play going forward. To, con <coughs> to conclude, I hope the book makes the reader appreciate the importance of global, global cooperation in solving the challenges ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Vidar. Thank you. And, and then we will do it like this, that we have these short presentations. This is a launching. So, and after that, you could ask questions. We don't take any questions right away, but that, that will be after all of the presentations. And now I'm very happy to call to the stage uh, Andrei Mineyev. He is a researcher at the Heinrich Center, and as I mentioned for you, he has been working tremendously to have this book to be a reality. So please, Andrei. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to present our book. This book is a result of work of 34 Arctic researchers from five countries, Norway, United States, Canada, Finland, Russia. I want to thank all the co-authors who contributed to it, and some of you are here with us today. Not least, I would like to thank our two anonymous referees, language expert Virginia, digital artist Ilpo, and our technical editor Alona, and not least, I want to forward huge thanks to the Routledge editorial board and support team. This book is about international cooperation in the Arctic. The book contains 14 thematic chapters written by established Arctic researchers from various disciplines. In addition to this, the book starts with a cross-disciplinary scenario chapter and it ends with integrating chapter, which makes conceptual contribution to understanding of international cooperation in the Arctic as a paradox-driven uh, cooperation. So the book starts with a chapter on Arctic cooperation scenarios up to 2035. Scenarios are images of alternative futures, very different ones. Each future has its own dilemmas, own challenges and opportunities. These scenarios are a very powerful way to signalize important underlying trends, fundamental uncertainties, challenges of the present and Scenario thinking shows us how various actions and decisions taken today or avoided, maybe, how they can play in long-term perspective in, in uh, alternative futures we may arrive in. In our analysis, we show that Arctic will play a key role in global development in the 21st century. But there are two important uncertainties at least two. Number one is international response to climate change. Would it be coordinated or fragmented? And number two is attitude to Arctic resources in the society. Would upcoming generation address the Arctic resources as something to be extracted and explored, or would they like to protect and preserve the resources? These two uncertainties and combinations of their outcomes result in four very different scenarios for international cooperation in the Arctic in 2035. I hope you will uh, enjoy reading this book and learn about our scenarios. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrei. And, um, 
maybe I now could ask more of you because now it, we should have even shorter uh, kind of presentations up till three, five minutes that you could stand here, all of you, and then we make it one by one. So I ask you to come to the stage, uh, Petter Nure. Uh, Petter Nure is an adjunct professor or a full professor, but uh, some Part of the law says that he could not be a full part of the professor because he has been full of wisdom. That means he has some age there that the Norwegian law say that then you can't be a full professor. I don't <laughs> understand that law, but that is the law. Um, so, and then I ask Jan Gunnar Winter, the CEO of Norwegian Center for the Ocean and the Arctic, to come. And I think you have to share a little the, the tables. And then I ask Ariel Mo research professor at Fritjof Nansen's Institute. And then I ask Elena Dipsina, associate professor at the Heinrich Center at New University Business School. And then uh, at last, I also ask Natalia Andreasen, professor uh, at NULAB at New University to come up here. And then I think I do it in that way that the name I mentioned, they, we will follow the presentation in that you could stand there in that row. So then the first is Petter. My contribution have been two. The first one was to try to put the relationship between Norway and Russia in a gas setting uh, and try to analyze that part from around 1990 until uh, 2014, and then how that gas bridge between Norway and Russia moved on and was switched, and suddenly it was the relationship, uh, gas relationship between Russia and China that became the important thing. And my analysis goes into what was the shift, what was the reason of the shift, and the key reason for that shift was basically the invasion of. of Crimea, and that led to a kind of marriage of convenience between Russia and China in the gas field. And I analyzed that relationship and asked the question, what is the future of that gas relationship? Is it a good one, bad one, within the framework of net zero? And my conclusion was that there was a very clear indication that there wasn't a very strong case for large imports of gas from Russia to China. Basically because of the net zero and increased production of gas in China. So that was the conclusion. And then I said everything hinges and it becomes pretty clear which way this relationship will go dependent on Will China and Russia commit to a new big gas pipeline called the Power of Siberia 2? And that was the end of my analysis. And lo and behold, this was, for the people who sort of follow these things, a very key element in the meeting between Putin and Xi just three weeks ago. Would the two countries commit to a big new gas pipeline? And the answer was, so far, Chi is holding off. And I think the analysis of my chapters indicates a little bit that it's not only because he's afraid of the consequences of, of sanctions, but because if you look at the consequences of a net zero and the absolute commitment that the Chinese actually have to net zero means that the decrease in future demand for gas, at least there is not room for huge new projects. So that's the first thing I did. And then the second one, I was basically participating in writing the scenario on how China becomes the superpower of the Arctic. And that is the scenario. And uh, I since I have very short time, all I can say is that read the scenario and or you might be very disagreement. That can never happen, but it's a scenario and it basically is a scenario about how China and Russia 
collaborate, and China uses its weaker brother, if you like, to actually gain a huge and, clo and a very dominant position in the Arctic, and not because they fire a shot at anybody, but because one of the reasons is that they use their position as the most dynamic country in the world, in my view, for actually trying to implement the green shift. So it's a net zero element in this story. So it, it's a huge topic, and thank you to the editors for being allowing me to sort of play out, especially the scenario. Uh, but uh, I've enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much, Peter. We just continue. So, Jan Gunnar. So I'm next. Yeah, yeah I, th I think okay, you are. Yeah, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm ready. Um, yeah. So uh, the chapter where I was responsible, uh, together with two good colleagues, Larry Hinsman, a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and also connected to the Office of Science and Technology Policy in, in the White House, and Kim Holmen at the Norwegian Polar Institute, we addressed scientific collaboration on climate change. And there are two parts, and the first one is much longer than the second one, and the first one is about the history of climate change collaboration, not temperature and sea ice melt and so on, but the bodies and processes connected to collaboration on climate change. And I must say, it's an exceptional uh, journey. Uh, it has been a fantastic uh, close collaboration, uh, and it's so much to mention, and I don't have time for that, but I can remind everyone that in 2004, 20 years ago, Arctic Climate Impact Assessment saw the light. That will made the world woke, wake up, I think, not only the Arctic community, about um, the kind of um, tremendous changes going on. Uh, and I think also it had a clear influence on the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, later. So we go through the history, and that we use a lot of space on. So if you ever ha are in need of a resume, I think it, this is a good <coughs> encyclopedia to, to look up, actually. And then we spend some time on future, and, and uh, in brief, climate change will continue. I resist and hesitate when many people at this conference says four times uh, more uh, or higher temperatures in the Arctic uh, than the globe, because that's a kind of an average. The Arctic is many Arctics, but at least we conclude that we have to foresee a development, unfortunately, with much more warming and all the consequences uh, connected to that. And we also put on the table the perspective of a sustainable green showroom. The Arctic can play a role as a region where you so show and develop the solutions of tomorrow, which will be good for the region, but it could also be exported to the rest of the world. Finally, we suggest and we really um, uh, make a recommendation that it should be a new international polar year in 20. 32, 33. Uh, that is how we end. Um, and we, we have argued why it's important uh, prior to that. And of course, while we were working, we got this war, uh, earthquake for collaboration, uh, which changes the game. Uh, and we have not addressed that part, but we have, uh, have the history up till the war broke out. Uh, and some of the future developments that we, that we see. But if I just use 30 seconds on, on what we haven't addressed, <laughs> I think we heard the Prime Minister yesterday said that there will be another day um, with respect to, to collaboration in the Arctic. Um, and I think he also said we will not go back to the normal that we knew from the past, but there could be a new normal, uh, and hopefully uh, that can happen. And in the context of this international polar year, which is nine years ahead, uh, you have to start planning for that five years ahead uh, of when it happens. So we just have enough time, actually, to get um, all scientists on board uh, if you are going to have a successful polar year in 32-33, which we hope will happen. But, of course, today it's hard to, to predict. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we continue with you, Aril. Uh, thank you. Yes, my um, chapter, which was uh, co-written with Bjorn Gunnarsson from the Center for High North Logistics here, is about uh, shipping, specifically the Northern Sea Route, Russia's Northern Sea Route. 
So what we did was to review uh, developments uh, over the last decade, what has been sort of the trends and typical features of shipping. And to put it very briefly, what you say that it's clear that development on the sea route has been because of domestic Russian drivers, not because of international interest, which was what many expected some 10, 12 years ago. Still, the development has been involving international actors in terms of uh, technologies and, and markets for the energy uh, resources that has been developed in, in, the, in the Russian Arctic. Now, uh, with the new global situation, uh, it's clear that risks associated with all kinds of investments in the Arctic, and in the Russian Arctic specifically, has increased very much. And it, it, this clearly involves uh, uh, risks related to investments in shipping, in costly shipping infrastructure, sh specially designed ships, but it also uh, is relevant for investment in resource extraction. So this sort of connects with what uh, Peter talked about, which is the key economic activity in the Russian Arctic. And as we see today, further development uh, in this area will now again be dependent on Russian decisions. But the question is, what are the Russian abilities to, uh, to sustain activity and to invest? They may be severely limited in the years ahead. And uh, given Russia's relative isolation, I think the only feasible or realistic partnership is with selected partner countries, and that is, in practice, mostly China. So, uh, with the, again, the, the, the Chinese element, I think, will be, be important. But I think we, we must also uh, realize that Chinese companies and investors, and even the Chinese state, they, they are also very much aware of risks. They are not taking undue risks. And to be very concrete, if you are a Chinese company, are you willing to invest heavily in Arctic LNG today? Are you sure that LNG from Russia will not be subject to sanctions in a few years' time? Can you justify the investment? I think that are the kind of questions they will ask. So it's not given, it's not given that China will go in with heavy investments in this sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then, Elena. Um, thank you, Frodo. Um, also would like to thank the editors of the book for giving a poss possibility to, uh, to be a part of it. Uh, I've been contributed in two chapters. One of them, um, not surprisingly, on smart city dialogue in the Arctic. Uh, but on the other, on the other chapter, um, together with uh, my colleague uh, Marit and Leif Christian, uh, we believe that uh, international cooperation uh, in education and research and uh, mutual respect and understanding are always uh, the foundation for the collaboration. And that we try to describe in this chapter that is devoted to the internationalization uh, in the high north of the, for the higher education institutions and how this is, what are the purposes and strategies. Uh, so in our chapter, we are actually showing uh, that what happens if the changes occur and how the willingness to cooperate, uh, which is built on the social and cultural uh, capital, can help to develop and strengthen the partnership uh, between the educational institutions. However, we also see that in the current situation, uh, one should be aware that uh, maintaining mutual trust uh, may be difficult. And in the present geopolitical conditions, co cooperation in the Arctic is both uh, uh, problematic, but on the other hand is essential. And we still need to address uh, the climate change, the pandemic and other challenges. And that's why, of course, all of these challenges, they bring this kind of extra level of complexity uh, to the current co international cooperation in education and research in the Arctic. So what we do, we ask actually our readers um, when they read the chapter to reflect uh, on the cases that we are discussing there and that are analyzed, that uh, to look at them as an example uh, of how educational institutions in the high north still have a significant responsibility uh, to contribute uh, to this region no matter what. 
And uh, we see that uh, higher educational institutions, uh, they need to restructure and rebuild their relationships while uh, maintaining the focus on the developing international cooperation in education and research. Based on those shared interests that we have through collaboration, continuity, trust and engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. And the last but not the least uh, snapshot will come from Natalia. Yes, thank you, Fruda. Uh, well, I will start uh, also with uh, thank, uh, say thank you to editors and uh, for, for inviting me to contribute to this book and for the whole process of editing. So thank you very much. Uh, our chapter is about international cooperation within emergency response in the Arctic. So the, the main point of it, so from the perspective of our chapter, we think that international cooperation is crucial for search and rescue, for marine environmental res uh, response, and for nuclear emergency preparedness. So we think that this, uh, this, this is crucial uh, to solve the global challenges in the Arctic and to make Arctic more safe and a uh, nicer place to uh, live. So this chapter is the analysis of two concrete cases of search and rescue operations in the maritime Arctic in two different uh, countries. And uh, th uh, through this analysis, we uncover the concept of international cooperation. So we find the international cooperation on different levels. That what does it mean? Uh, in the cooperation uh, for governance principles, cooperation within operational procedures, and also cooperation uh, within joint exercises and joint projects to enhance trust between the countries. So the conclusion is that we definitely need the cooperation uh, and to need to um, develop uh, the cooperation and trust between people, between young and experienced professionals, among academia and uh, professional and governmental organizations. And uh, yes, the, the post reflections uh, shows that uh, the situation is now uh, very different and difficult. So we need uh, maybe to think about the new structures and maybe we need this uh, balance method for the whole Arctic and uh, different aspects of, uh, of the question. Thank you very much. And maybe we should give them a good hand. <laughs> And then we are open for questions and also to Andre, you have to be close to us. Are there any questions to these authors? And I think they are so, so, so knowledgeful that you could ask questions in different areas. Okay, please, Andreas. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, maybe a question to, to all of you, um, not directly related to one of the articles per se, but uh, nowadays we hear a lot about rare earth ma materials and minerals and how this will be the new, uh, maybe the future development, economic development in the Arctic. I mean, Ariel has done a lot on, on shipping and others and, and better on, on oil and gas, but will we see a different story when it comes to rare earth minerals and exploiting them in the Arctic than what we have seen over the last 10, 15 years when it comes to the future of shipping in the Arctic, of oil and gas in the Arctic, will the story be different based on Europe's transition, the global transition towards a greener uh, future, or will we see a same old that there's a lot of potential, maybe a lot of hype, but in the end it will be a rather silent story. I don't know who wants to answer that future development. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Andreas. And Gunnar was first up with his finger. How many minutes do you have? Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question. But first of all, to, to kind of sort a little bit, um, um, we should distinguish between high seas, which is very little of in the Arctic, uh, that is regulated through a UN-affiliated uh, body, the International Seabed Authority, and coastal state sovereign rights, um, including Norway, that has opened formally an opening process for seabed minerals quite recently. So th what I'm saying is that we will have one regime in these small areas in, t uh, in, the, in the highest 
seas in, in the Arctic uh, Ocean, and then we will have potentially five different ways of doing this for the five coastal states. Um, I think um, this is a very controversial area already, and it will become much more controversial. Uh, and there is two really, and this is simplified, but there are two um, positions here. We don't have enough knowledge. We need more knowledge, and it takes time to, to monitor and get environmental data and so on. We need a moratorium. Ten years. That's the position of quite a few bodies, international and, and countries. The other one is that we need the minerals for the green shift, and we need to hurry up. And of course, what I think as a scientist is lacking today is a life cycle analysis of the advantages and disadvantages, so you can actually make a mathematical calculation uh, of, of the pros and cons, because today uh, the, the discussion is polarized, and the lack of knowledge is obvious, I think. You can't dispute that, really. Uh, and the consequences uh, of, of mining at seabed is, um, is a bit uh, unpredictable. And it's different also where you have different rare elements. You have the nodules, which are simple and not to give such an environmental impact. And you have the crust mining, which is much more impactful. So, so there are many nuances in this. Sorry for being long, but I, I think I could have kept mm. on for much longer. <laughs> that, that's very okay. I mean, Ariel has uh, asked for a f well, comment just, and also uh, Peter. Just that, I mean, very important what uh, Gudrun is saying, but there are also such uh, rare earth minerals onshore. And, uh, but it's early days. Uh, very little has been really developed. And it, it, is, it should be stressed that uh, exploring for and developing such resource is, is a very big uh, long-term long -term process and very costly, which means that you have some of the same issues that you have with, with the oil and gas, long-term long uh, big investments. So even if in Russia it is considered to be a big potential, it's a question of investment risks and also, of course, investment rights. But the global situation with more need for such resources at the same time as many Western countries want to reduce the dependence on China means that there will be more pressure towards such uh, projects, I think. But it's, it's not something that is happening from one day to another. It's a long-term process. Thank you. And a very, very short comment, Peter. Well, the fourth, uh, one of the four scenarios is called Klondike Arctic. And that's where this, mm. uh, this activity can sort of be part of. And uh, it's very easy to write a scenario about, you know, more of the same. Here we go again. All the same mistakes are being made. But, come on, scenarios are there for thinking differently. Maybe you actually, for once, might be able to do this in a reasonably sustainable way. And if you find all of these re resources not on the western side of the Arctic countries, but in Russia, you know, then you are bound to have a sort of the Chinese element in this story. And that plays into a combination of the two scenarios. So it, it's, there's lots of things, but thanks for, the, for, the, for making this very clear that this is a very complicated issue. And uh, thank you. And the last comment on that is Elena. Oh, oh, uh, both. All should, both you will do first, Elena, and then Natalia. Um, I, I will, I don't know nothing about the minerals, <laughs> but <laughs> the, I think it was a very good answer here. But I think if just to see like what uh, we have observed in our cases when we were looking at the international cooperation in education and research, we definitely see that as soon as the governments and the authorities, they kind of agreed of the rules of the game, like and if it is a moratorium or if it is some kind of who will be participating or not, like it was with the delimination line, for example, then it was there is a kind of common understanding and then the, for the institutions, for the universities, it's much more easier to establish the programs because then it is, there are those conditions uh, for this uh, development. And in addition, of course, it is also the people who will be working with these kind of programs because if it is the support and understanding, then I think um, uh, the education programs will be developed in line how it, if it, there are the frameworks for that one. 
Mm. Thank you. And the then the last one, yes. yes. Uh -huh, yeah, please. So, uh, in case we are using new uh, raw materials or not using, or n using new technologies and innovations, and in case something happens, we actually cannot use an excuse that uh, it was something unpredictable anymore. Because we know that we need to, if we are using something new, we need to have a plan for and think mm -hmm. about consequences for security and safety of the people and environment. Thank you very much. And just to say the time has run out and I know there are new meetings and also some planes and ships, boats uh, leaving. So thank you very much and I will just thank you. And, and I will just tell you to all of you, if you would like to give a, a very uh, important and, and expensive present, to some of your friends, you should buy this book, a hardcover. It's very, very expensive. But if you would like just to read a book and have the wisdom, it is free of charge because this is an open access book. You could find the information in the website of the conference about how to download the book. So thank you very much all. We are looking forward to 2035. <laughs> Du har...